個科技咧，就好似生命冇咗水一樣，生存唔到。做生意首先要諗自己覺得過唔過癮先，冇科技係永遠都唔會有創新嘅。Dream it possible， 唔好俾自己有框框，早啲同銀行傾你個計劃，你會早啲完成你嗰個目標。即上恒生商業銀行 YouTube 頻道睇足本分享，實踐創業夢，將不可能變可能。恒生最新商業户口，最快三天開户，全程網上辦妥，立即上網或致電查詢啦。Welcome to the HKTDC Entrepreneur Day 2021. During the three-day event, simultaneous interpretation services in English, Cantonese, and Mandarin will be provided. You may select the audio channel next to the video frame, and you're also welcome to raise questions through the Q&A box. Selected questions will be asked at the Q&A session towards the end of this webinar. Without further ado, the session, Food Tech, the Alternative Food Trend, will now begin. Please welcome our first speaker of the session, Ms. Katharina Junger, founder and CEO of Living Farms. Hi, Katharina, could you hear us? Hello, Katharina, can you hear us? Hello, Katharina. Hi, hi. Hi, can you hear us clearly? Yes, I can hear yeah. you. So the floor is yours, please. Okay, well, very thanks. Uh, many thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Katharina. I'm a founder and CEO of Live in Farms. Uh, we have locations both in Vienna, Austria, where I am right now, uh, and in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, our company is uh, focusing on technology for insect farming, and we've actually come a long way. Uh, we started out in 2013, as early as 2013, but having established a company in 2015, um, and we're working really to uh, build technology, technology to facilitate insect farming and breeding, rearing and breeding, so all, the whole life cycle of the insects in order to implement waste management solutions uh, on a large scale. Um, and as you can see on the timeline here, we have done this throughout the years in different scales. So on a very small scale and on a very large scale. And I'm going to talk about um, the technology behind it, uh, the system behind it, as well as uh, the story of our company uh, and what we're doing today. So um, the background uh, is a protein gap that, uh, that we'll face very soon. So uh, in Europe alone, and now I'm talking about uh, Europe, we're importing 75% of all proteins into the country from abroad, from countries such as uh, uh, Brazil, um, South America, um, but also from Asia, in fact. Um, we do not grow enough protein-rich feeds and foods uh, in, in the continent. Um, so we will face a huge protein gap by 2030 that will cause us quite some trouble. Um, and here you see a few uh, animals pictured that are the immediate market for insect proteins. Um, one of the first ones is effectively pet food, uh, where insects are very beneficial because they they have hypoallergenic um, properties. So they are less harmful uh, in terms of allergies. Uh, to uh, pets' bodies, uh, and therefore very popular. Uh, but also fish is a very big uh, uh, big and important market because fish effectively is today being fed with fish from the ocean. And as you know, by 2030, we, uh, we will only have 10% of the fish stock remaining in the ocean. That will have fundamental issues also for our environment. So um, every ton of uh, fish meal that we can uh, replace with insect proteins for fish feed, for example, but also for other feeds, we will save five tons of 
fish in the ocean. Um, and then something that has recently opened up is the market um, for poultry and pigs. Also, their protein-rich feed is needed. Um, and what is not pictured here is, of course, the human food market. That is uh, something that is still quite small, um, however, growing very fast. Um, and uh, we see that um, insect proteins will definitely be implemented in the, in, in the human food market um, in, the coming, in the coming years. We see it way more often already in comparison to years ago. Um, why are we uh, talking about insect proteins as alternatives? The current ways of protein production really consume the planet. So I mentioned the fish stock depleting for fish protein, for example. Um, however, also there's a lot of CO2 emissions or CO2 equivalent greenhouse gas uh, emissions related to the production of proteins, even plant-based proteins. So uh, uh, in uh, by 2030, we will emit nine gigatons uh, of CO2 by conventional protein production. And that is already the second biggest factor for climate change. So it is really urgent that we do something about it. Um, and the second issue um, that we're facing and that we're tackling with our technology is food waste. So if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest after China and, uh, and the US. Um, so uh, food waste is actually also a very large emitter of greenhouse gases um, and insects are ideally positioned to tackle food waste, to eat and consume food waste in a very efficient manner and turn it into proteins like no other animal uh, can do. Uh, and that is why it is, it is such, uh, uh, such great potential. Insect proteins, uh, for you to, to understand, uh, even in comparison with plant-based proteins that are already quite carbon efficient, um, save about 92% uh, per unit protein as compared to soy. Uh, why is that number so high? Um, a lot of it uh, is related to actually the, the resources and the infrastructure that is needed to grow uh, a, a plant like such as soy. You need fertile land, you need uh, a large uh, large acres of land. Uh, you need this land to be fertile. You need to fertilize it. You need to water it. Um, all the and also the logistics cost, uh, cost and, and emissions are behind that. Um, so therefore, soy is a really uh, is is already good in terms of um, of, of carbon um, emission. However, insects save really a large chunk of that. And the key. Uh, point of it really is that they can eat uh, food waste and therefore we can create circular systems. We do not have to grow or uh, plant crops specifically to feed these animals, but we can use resources that are already available and out there. So let me show you the circular system behind it. Um, on the right hand side, you see uh, bakery waste or, or, uh, or other organic waste uh, that is used in insect farming. Um, we make insect proteins for food and feed, mainly feed out of it. That then uh, goes back into, into food and feed products. Um, and uh, a side product of insect production is fertilizer. Uh, we call it frass in the insect world. And that is being used again as a, as a food for, for plants. So plants can be grown again. And so it feeds back into, uh, into the system. Um, here you see a comparison of, um, in comparison to, to, to beef, insect proteins um, are, of course, a, a very uh, breakdown, a, a, a large chunk of, of uh, resources uh, in terms of land use. We're talking about 10% only in terms of food that is needed per kilogram of, um, of, um, of um, biomass water, and then, of course, also uh, greenhouse gas emissions that we're talking about. So what do we do as a company? We have two uh, arms at the moment. One is in Hong Kong, the one that you see here on the left side, and the other one is Vienna. Um, in Hong Kong, we focus on education, on awareness building. We developed a small scale device. We call it Hive Explorer. Hi the name Hive comes from Beehive, um, so a place where, where insects can thrive. Um, there in Hong Kong, we focus on sustainability education. So we deliver products, mini insect farms to grow mealworms uh, in schools, in homes, to show circular economy, to show how a circular systems work, 
um, and how fun it can also be. Um, we do workshops and events. And uh, in Vienna, we focus on industrial technology. So what we do in Hong Kong on a tiny, tiny scale, we do in, uh, in Vienna or in Europe, we build it on a very large one for industrial factories where our customers are uh, customers and factories in the food and feed business. Um, and uh, I will get closer into that a bit later. Uh, but again, a, a few steps back about our history. That was our beginning. So we, we developed a, a, a couple of devices in the insect farming uh, field um, that you see here um, for black soldier flies. So we're talking about two types of insects that we're farming, black soldier fly larva, so a fly larva, particularly for feed, and then the mealworm, um, which is a beetle larva specifically for food purposes. And you see the development here, how we went and, uh, um, and the right uh, image you see, um, this is what we, what we also commercialized. And uh, that turned into the Hive Explorer that you see on, on, on these images now. So it's a, um, a whole life cycle device. So the whole life cycle of the insect happens in that device. Um, we're, we're STEM org uh, um, authenticated. So um, we have a lot of uh, um, uh, work done in the education field as a tool for, for young people to learn about uh, sustainability, zero waste, and circular economies. Um, so here, just a system of how it works in you to have a, an insect farm in your home and effectively compost, if you will, um, um, food wastes in your kitchen or in your school. Um, the values that we, we teach and the principles reach what I said from food waste recycling, circular economies to insect growing technology. So it's really a very STEM heavy um, 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 product. Um, and of course, the sustainable development goals um, that we consider in our curriculum uh, that we've developed um, for both Hong Kong local schools as well as international schools. And now I'm getting, going over to uh, what we do on an industrial scale. Um, um, our product there is called Hive Pro, Hive Professional. It's an automated robotic uh, insect feeding and processing factory. So here we're really talking large scale. Uh, we're talking factory size. Um, and on that scale, um, it's, a, it's a plug and play solution for B2B businesses that have access to waste or that have waste already. So um, for example, a, a French fry producer uh, that has um, thousands of tons of potato waste every year, juice producers, uh, grain processors, starch producers, they all have byproducts from production that are effectively food and, and, uh, or feed grade um, and that they currently pay to get rid of it. So usually that's, uh, can, that can be up to a six digit loss for them. Uh, sometimes it's cost neutral, but most of the time it actually costs money to get rid of the waste. And it's of course also um, and uh, a factor for emissions. Um, for, for those customers, we provide plug and play solutions. Uh, our, uh, uh, our factory plugs into and go, go gets into the infrastructure of theirs. We feed the, the, um, the waste from their factory, feeds into um, our Hive Pro. Um, we come up with food recipes so that we, uh, our knowledge and our IP lies in how to process the feed so that it's ideal for the insects to process. We set up the machinery and then we deliver uh, baby larva uh, frequently so that the customer only uh, in an automated fashion can get rid of the waste and produce proteins, fats and fertilizers that they can then sell into the animal feed market. Um, the technology consists of a couple of um, uh, uh, areas. So it's feed processing. So that's where the interface happens to the factory of the customer. That's where feed is being uh, inserted. Um, then it goes through robotic handling where uh, trays are being filled with the substrate, with the material. Uh, baby larvae are inserted there that are shipped by us in literally uh, the, the, the growth factor of the insects is so big that tiny, tiny larvae um, are inserted, like are, are shipped there in a, a cardboard box size and they can fill entire factories. Um, and then uh, in the rearing section, that's where the insects eat for seven days. Uh, and then within seven days, they're ready and done. They go back to the robotic handling system uh, are separated there from their manure. Um, so fertilizer is being harvested there and in the end product processing 
uh, module um, uh, protein powder, fat and fats are extracted. Um, and those are then products that are sold into the feed markets. Um, so just uh, for you to see roughly the size, the scale of our technology, this is one of our customers. It's a starch producer uh, here in Austria. And you see that uh, uh, on the side, this is the size of our technology. So we're really talking industrial scale. It starts at around 1,500 square meters and goes up to several thousands, depending on, uh, on the quantity of the input material that the customer wants. What can we uh, um, use in terms of substrates for the insects to eat? Um, we have a large variety. We're talking about a, the fly, a fly larva um, that can really eat a large variety of waste. Um, in, on the industrial categories, there's bakery waste, for example, grain-based waste um, that is often available, potato waste, carrot waste, or other vegetable waste, beer waste, brewery waste, also pre-consumer vegetable waste. When I talk pre-consumer, um, that is before it landed on customers' plates, so meaning uh, unsold goods from a supermarket, for example. And um, in Europe, that is important to mention that it's not post but pre-consumer because in Europe, we're not allowed to feed waste that has already been on a customer's plate because it's considered not safe. Uh, in Asia, that's a different story. In Asia, we are allowed to feed post-consumer waste even, so regulation is not as tight. Uh, and then also, of course, grain wastes. Um, how does it work um, with the factory um, and with our customers? Um, we're talking about, I, I show you an example here. Uh, for example, we're talking about a pilot scale for stillage waste. It's a side product of starch production. About 8,000 tons per year, for example, go uh, come out uh, of starch production at that particular site. Um, the Hive Pro technology then processes it um, and uh, we ship baby larva and we provide the equipment and the output of that equipment is protein powder, lipids and fertilizer in the amount of 330 tons protein powder, 120 tons of lipids and 1000 tons of fertilizers just so that you can imagine um, the quantities that are behind that. And um, we are talking here about an emission cut of about 70%. If you compare it not to soy protein, not to the end products, but to the process to composting. So some of our customers, they currently uh, put their products into composting processes and uh, we are saving 70% emissions as, as compared to, to that. Um, here again about our business model, you see the, the equipment sales, the seedlings, the baby larva, and farming as a service, so a monitoring uh, a concept where our factories are online, you can monitor them, you can actually supervise them from afar, and in this way, we can help the customer um, uh, really run the factory in an optimal way. The idea here is really that we saw that customers, industrial customers, they do not want to become insect technologies com technology companies. They really want to simply make revenue uh, on their waste that they currently pay for, uh, and they want to save emissions. Um, a lot of companies these days have corporate responsibilities, corporate sustainability goals, uh, and that is also, of course, very important to them. Um, and um, we provide these plug and play solutions because in that sense, uh, the customers really do not have to worry about uh, uh, gaining a lot of skills. They get a set of uh, tools from us, uh, equipment, seedlings, and um, the system to run it. And then they can uh, actually produce proteins that they can sell from starting in the, in the first month of operation. So it is a very fast turnaround uh, in that sense. Um, so I'm at the end of, of, of my presentation here. Um, our motto is let's secure the future of food together. You're very welcome to visit us on thehiveexplorer.com for education and sustainability education solutions and at uh, liveinfarms.com. Thanks, Katharina, for sharing the story of Living Farms with us. Next, we will have Ms. Carrie Chen, CEO of Athen Meats Company Limited. Hello, Carrie. Could you hear us clearly? Uh, yes. 
Thank you. So the time is yours. Okay. Thank you. Um, nice to meet everyone. This is Carrie, founder and CEO of Avant. We are a cultivated meat company. Today, I'm very happy to share with you what we do, the technology, and what is the product that will be coming to our table very soon. Um, so to begin with, we know that why we have to do it, right? Um, we know that the way that we're producing meat, basically raising animals, slaughtering them, and, and then, you know, and then get whatever we want to be, you know, incorporated in the cuisine, the existing system is not efficient. Um, it's not, you know, it's also very cruel for the animal. It's not good for the planet as well. As we know, the greenhouse gets a lot of the pollutant from the traditional animal agriculture. It's ruining our planet and we're really running out of time. So we look at the meat industry, how is it growing, and then what are the opportunities, what are the options we have actually in front of us. Meat industry is projected to reach 1.8 trillion US dollar in the next couple of decades. And now, although we have not even considered other kind of meat um, substitute, but starting to see some products such as, um, we call that, you know, uh, plant-based meat or mock meat, they are under the category of, we call that novel vegan meat replacement. They basically using plant material to mimic the experience of the sensory and flavor and everything that meat, traditional meat over, and then they are vegetarian product. They are already commercialized. We can see a lot of products in the supermarket as of today. However, one very important segment is actually coming. Um, it's not fully commercialized yet. There's only one product in the market uh, selling in Singapore. Uh, we see that the, the commercialization will be in much larger scale starting from 2023, in, including product that is going to be launched by Avon, our company. Um, so this product is cultivated meat. So it's basically real meat. Uh, we, 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 we know that with meat, we, we raise an animal, they grow muscles, they grow tissues, they grow fat, and then, you know, as they're big enough, we slaughter them and then we get. So imagine this process is actually taking place, not inside animal bodies, but outside of animal bodies. So, you know, this is the technology that have been already used in medical field uh, for treatment of, um, you know, illness and things like that. But since a few years ago, we are starting to migrate this technology into the other application, including food. Cultivated meat is projected to be over 600 billion US dollar opportunity in the next couple of um, decades. Um, so this is something that we have a lot already achieved uh, a lot of um, you know, interest from different big food group. They are all looking at alternative way to hatch how they're going to produce meat in the future, knowing that the climate change and a lot of the animal disease is actually having a lot of challenges on the traditional meat production. Not to mention there are a lot of investors already putting in money into this space. Um, so this is the number that we're looking at. All alternative protein have already up to last year already uh, attracted over 3 billion US dollar uh, capital investment into this uh, new tech a different solution. For Avon, we choose to, we develop technology pl platform that we can produce uh, pork, chicken, beef, etc. Where we situated, we want to address the fish uh, challenge in our first go-to product, uh, go-to market product. Why we care about fish? Maybe we, some of us know the earth oxygens, half of them actually coming from the ocean. So the ocean well-being is super important for the survival of human being. We know that for beef, there are a lot of greenhouse gas, a lot of you know, carbon uh, footprint, but oxygen is even more important, equally important. So it is very important that we also take care about the well-being ecosystem and marine kind of balance diversity of our ocean. And if we look at what we are consuming now, half of the fish are actually from the ocean and half of them are uh, farmed. So imagine uh, pork and beef and chicken, no longer human beings are actually catching them from the wild. Basically there's no enough cow and pig for us to poach in order to make into meat product. But we are doing, still doing this with fish. So it has extracted a very huge pressure on the ocean. Overfishing is a major problem and Aquaculture really help with this because basically our planet can no longer some support the extensive you know growth of this demand, but there are a lot of limitation. Um, the domesticatable species are limited. There are also environmental impact from the aquaculture, and um, as well as intensive farming. There are also other uh, concerns such as disease and also antibiotic use and in that space. So that's why, in addition to the aquaculture, we do need to look at the third solution. And why we also focus on 
seafood is because globally, 60% uh, of the uh, seafood and fish is actually consumed in Asia where we are situated. And if we look at the number, China is really the top of the consumption uh, country. And the growth rate is actually, you know, really the the largest among different regions of the world. So exactly the reason why we would like to cater for this demand as well as addressing the environmental impact of this demand. And for us, we know that a lot of fish actually is the most uh, extensively traded kind of meat type. And um, trees are actually dragged all around the world. Look at this uh, chart here. All over the world, um, the extensive coal train, which is very runnable, carbon emission is all of the reason why we need to try to centralize, uh, not decentralize the whole supply chain of seafood using this technology. And if we look at greenhouse gas emission, um, the that deeper blue color is actually the aquaculture and the fish. So if we look at the deeper blue color, now it's only half of what we are, we are consuming. Uh, remember, um, still roughly about half of the fish is actually farmed. So that means that if we really want to farm all of the fish, we are actually, uh, you know, consuming the whole kind of like imp input um, of the greenhouse gas will be double and it will be very sizable, very similar to pork and other kind of meat type. So do not understand, underestimate the environmental footprint of actually the fish products. Now looking at cultivated meat, um, as per our projection, cultivated meat is one of the promising solution that we can reduce drastically the life cycle uh, of the impact on the environment to really a fraction of what the conventional method is actually uh, producing. So from cons consumer perspective, um, for fish, we know that a lot of challenges, including mercury, including nuclear wastewater, including antibiotics, and for seafood in particular, microplastic, not knowing that we could be actually consuming over 55,000 pieces of tiny little bit of microplastic, not even visible to the naked eyes, is actually quite alarming. And um, as we have already mentioned, 90% of the marine ecosystem already exploited. These are the number, basically we lose count of the number of fish that we have farmed and caught every year. And for fish supplies, we do have investors, we have also partners expressing that, you know, they really support this technology because of the global warming, you know, the, the change in the whole planet and the ocean uh, condition. They are also subject to the threat of the environmental change. Uh, even either do they catch free from the ocean or are they raising fish near to the ocean or near to rivers? Um, so this solution is uh, essential. The more we the, the more we see the the, the uh, planet is changing, the more we see that it become very essential. Now these are the new planetary challenges. We need a new solution. So other than the previous race caught and slaughter, we actually use one solution, which is, um, is cultivation. A new class of fish is born using this technology. So uh, the bioprocess, just to make it easier to understand, I put it side by side with other very similar bioprocesses. We have been used to produce other food and products. So it's actually very similar to how we make yogurt and beer. We all start with a uh, very healthy population of the, uh, the organism that we need. In the case of yogurt, it's bacteria, healthy bacteria. In beer, it's yeast. And in this case, it's a very healthy uh, cell uh, population that is we extracted from healthy animals and carefully screened and verified and tested before they put into use. Next, we provide them with food just like animal in our bodies. We need to eat food and then the food go to the cells and the cells double and grow in the muscles. Similarly, we provide them with the food. Now the cells, they do not have teeth, they cannot digest, they cannot chew. So the food we feed to them is actually in liquid form. So no different from the nutrients we need for us, you know, human being keeping healthy. They are actually glucose, minerals, amino acids, and vitamins, and some proteins. And similar to what we feed to the yogurt, which is lactose and other kind of material for beers and things like that. The third important element is the living environment. So keeping them in the right temperature, they like, for example, mammalian cells or mammals, around 37 degrees Celsius, 38. And for fish, it's actually a little bit lower using even less energy, about 30 something degrees Celsius. So basically it's a machine that we keep the temperature right, we keep the pH level right, and then we keep you know, mixing them, you know, the food with the cells. And voila, in about a month and a half to two months, we will get the, the meat, get the, the, the protein from the whole process. 
think about it compared to raising a fish in a fish farm, depending on the species, it could be roughly about a year and more to the size of the fish that we put in the plate to steam. So two months versus about 12 months, it is really one, um, one sake of the time. So it's definitely helping us to take care of the challenge global is to produce food in an even faster pace to feed the growing uh, population around the world. About our farms, um, briefly introduced, we started in 2018. Um, our first laboratory is in Hong Kong Science Park. And we launched our first uh, product prototype, which is a uh, fish maw. In Asian, we know that it's a very tasty delicacy. It's also good for our health. And we launched it in our um, in a food tech summit um, in 2019. And last year, we have completed our second prototype, which is a fish fillet. Uh, look at this picture. Imagine it can be actually in uh, used in like a fish burger or around, you know, different kind of recipe and fast food shop. And we're very fortunate to also have uh, invited an uh, independent party, including a reporter from Reuters to uh, attend our tasting and also actually have a co uh, cover the event in an article. We are also using this technology to produce non-food ingredients such as marine peptide that can be used as an active ingredient in skincare products such as serum, face cream, and face mask. And um, because of this solution, um, having a lot of you know benefit for the environment and also as a way of localized production um, of the protein that we can cater for the challenges of that um, protein supply, different regions of the world. Um, we are very grateful to be recognized as a technology pioneer by the World Economic Forum this year. And um, as of earlier this year, um, in addition to Hong Kong, we have already expanded to Singapore. We have a laboratory as well as building out our pipeline in Singapore. Uh, we also have partners in uh, China, including a major um, investor in uh, Beijing, as well as Zhongshan, which is a technology uh, uh, partner as well. And so to uh, on the high level, just for um, audience information, this technology, two challenges. One is the cost reduction. The other is the actual scale of the production. So we have already addressed the major uh, cost uh, reduction uh, challenge as of last year by reducing one of the uh, removing one of the key cost driver, which is we call the fetal bovine serum. End of last year, we already reduced the cost by 90%. And in addition to that, we are also other patent pending solution to reduce the cost further so that we're looking at price priority similar to premium grade or fish fillet product out there around 2024, 2025. And um, we briefly mentioned we have a John's lab and we're also building our pilot plant in Singapore, target to be in operation end of last uh, end of next year. This are uh, the um, before we, we go, um, I would like to briefly introduce a product we're going to launch in the next uh, about 18 months or so. Um, we have um, we have two product uh, trademark uh, brand. One is Salalin, which is a skin care active ingredient that actually have the skin to uh, stimulate the growth of uh, collagen and other, you know, under the skin texture uh, material, extracellular matrix material. And so this is one of the our early product that could be launched in the market. The other is that we would like to launch something that really resonates with the Asian market uh, consumer, uh, including fish mall. So this is a picture we have recently in September, we have um, completed and launched uh, in a private tasting uh, in Hong Kong. Um, and then, of course, uh, we're looking at doing uh, more like large uh, market and fast moving uh, kind of product, including fish fillet, which already demonstrated earlier last year, uh, such as um, in this picture under the brand of Avi. And um, so this is um, a very brief introduction of Avon and the technology. Um, our website is a Avi, uh, avonleads.com and look forward to um, hearing any question from you and also uh, sharing um, any more update from you through our website there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Harry, for your insights into food tech. Next, we'll have Ms. Anushka Prohit, CEO and co-founder of Bria Limited. Anushka, please. Thank you so much. I think it's great that I'm going after Avant because she just alluded to the bio process of making beer, and that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today. So hi everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Anushka and I'm representing Breer, or as you can see on the slide, The Able Company. So before I talk a little bit more about Breer and Base, The Able Company is essentially this parent company that the four of us as co-founders decided to put into place because we're here and we want to reintroduce concepts or ideas that are otherwise wasted back into the supply chain ecosystem. 
So let me begin by talking about where all of this started. So all of us are actually college students. I myself am in my final year right now in HKUST. And this idea came to us a little over a year ago when we realized that, of course, Hong Kong is constantly battling this huge food waste problem, where on a daily basis, a lot of the materials that don't get sold in stores have to be thrown. But at the same time, we wanted to take part in a social impact competition. And for that, we needed not only just a problem, but also a way to solve it. And so it just so happened that we were all celebrating the end of exams together. And that's when we, it just struck to us that bread and beer are made of the same constituent elements. So a little bit of a personal story of mine, as you can see on the bottom left, for me, I came face to face with the idea of food wastage in Hong Kong when I was 10. So for my 10th birthday, I went to Starbucks for the very first time. And as I was buying my Frappuccino, I saw that the barista was taking all of the cakes, sandwiches, breads behind the glass shelves and putting it straight into a black rubbish bag. So I remember asking myself, that looks good to eat right now, but why is it going to be thrown? And that's when I came face to face with you know, the huge scale of this problem of food wastage. And that's when I knew that I wanted to do something and change that for Hong Kong. And so when once we realized that this is the problem we wanted to solve, it was only natural for us to go on and do more research and see exactly how big is the scale of this problem. So we were shocked to know that on a daily basis, Hong Kong wastes 3,600 tons of food every single day. And a mere huge 47% of all of that food is just leftover bread. So I'm sure all of us are familiar with the early mornings that we have office to run to or events to run to. And sometimes we don't have time to make breakfast. So what's our go-to solution? Go to the nearest bakery and pick up a slice of bread. But what we don't realize is at the end of the day, nobody really is looking for bread to fill their appetite anymore. And that's why the amount of bread that is in those bakeries is most likely left unsold. And what happens when the bread is left unsold in bakeries? The bakeries have no choice but to throw it away because throughout the entirety of the day, the bread is left exposed to the air and therefore is not in the highest or most optimal quality condition. And as you can see, this problem is so major that as of 2020, the Hong Kong government anticipated that all three of Hong Kong's landfills would be full. Now, thankfully, that statistic moved forward by one year to 2021, but it's crazy to think that it's the first day of December and we're just a month away from this statistic becoming our reality. So it was clear that it was important for us as Hong Kongers to do something for the city that we call home. So we decided to make beer from bread. But of course, it's important when you start any type of entrepreneurship venture to make sure that the market is lucrative and that there is potential for you to make money so that you can constantly be innovating new ideas. So we decided to analyze the existing beer market and we were pleasantly surprised to know that Hong Kong consumes more than 30 plus billion liters of beer every year, which is a market worth 1.2 billion US dollars and has an incredible growth rate, 3.1% in beer sales as of when we did the PowerPoint, but I'm sure now it's closer to 5%. And this has, of course, also been accelerated after the pandemic, where after a brief period of time of no interaction with food and beverage, everybody is more than excited now to go back out there and try new products. So we, as Breer, decided to focus in on the market valued at $569 million by catering to those who are looking forward to trying new tastes of beer and, of course, being sustainable while they're doing that. So with that, we went on to analyze our target segment. And it only made sense for us to pick people who were in our league or close to us, because then we would be able to understand them much better. So we honed in on people aged 18 to 34 year olds who have a drive for sustainability and a comparatively higher propensity for spending. So they wouldn't mind taking out five or $10 more as long as the product is completely in line with their personal values. And that's when we decided that this was an idea that we would launch in the Hong Kong market focusing on this specific network. And when we first began, and I would highly recommend everyone looking to start a venture of their own to do that with a survey. We launched a survey asking you know, our friends, family, peers, professors even, if they would want to try this bread beer, if we were to put it on the market. And as you can see, a whopping 93% of respondents of the survey said they would. And that gave us the confidence to take this from an idea to a business. So with that, at the core of our business model, we want to follow the positive sustainable frameworks that the United Nations has put forward for us. And Breer specifically aligns with five of them. 
So naturally, we do want to work towards zero hunger, although a lot of people think that's counterintuitive because what happens one day if we've used up all the bread and there's no more waste, then how will we make bread beer? But we have other ideas, and we'll get to that later. But we are working towards making sure that we are inculcating this concept of responsible consumption and production of every good that we interact with. And all in all, working towards the goal number 13, which is to start creating climate action. So now onto the fun part. Let's talk a little bit more about beer. So a lot of people don't know, but actually beer is made with only three ingredients, barley, hops, and yeast. And as you can see here on the slide, 78% of that mash ton is just barley. So what we do in the brewing of bread beer is instead of putting in 80% uh, of barley, we would put in bread. So we take slices of bread, as you would imagine, break them into smaller pieces, and put them directly into the mash tun. And as you can see in the graphic here, the rest of the beer brewing process remains exactly the same. And that works to our advantage because when we contract brew from existing breweries, they no longer have to buy new ingredients or even buy new machinery to change their normal days of work for us. And that gives them incentive to work with us as well. So hops and yeasts are really just the elements that help you flavor your beer. So depending on the style of the beer, the taste of the beer, you would alternate with these constituent elements. So with that, once we had all of these nitty gritties out of the way, we decided to give it a shot. So like I mentioned earlier, we had this idea initially for a social innovation competition. So of course we went on and pitched the idea and thankfully everyone thought it was cool, so we won. And when we won, they gave us 10,000 Hong Kong dollars. And now it was on to us to actually try and make our idea turn into reality. So we brewed what you can see on the slide here responsibly, which was our very, very first beer and our pilot beer. And we took this as a challenge to see if bread actually could turn into beer. And thankfully it did. While I will admit that the taste probably wasn't as its best as it is now, it definitely was a step in the right direction and showed us that there is potential here. And since then, we went a little crazy. We made so many different types of beer, starting from the two on the left, which were Sensession and Eel 52. These were beers that we brewed with Mediterranean toast and dark rye bread, and even making a tequila beer for those who don't necessarily like beer, but like the tequila. In fact, we even worked with a popular chain here in Hong Kong, Bike Me Dang, to use their ever so famous milk bread to make a milk pale ale. But what we did come across then is this brand new idea of making pizza crust beer. So when we had this idea of beer, we were connected to the Jardine Restaurant Group here in Hong Kong to potentially discuss how we can make more products of beer. But when we went into the room and told them about this idea, they said, you know, that's great. Beer sounds like an amazing idea. But here's the honest truth. We don't make bread. We make pizza crust. So what can you do for us with pizza crust? And that's when the four of us took it on to ourselves as a challenge to try and take this pizza crust and make beer from it. And thus came about Base. So Base is actually the world's first pizza crust beer. And as you can see here, it's a very nice, citrusy, fruity beer with 5.5% alcohol by volume, which we hope will launch in Pizza Hut hopefully next year. And so since then, we've gone on to do a lot of sales. Our current Breer Pale Ale is actually available for sale in 30 to 35 different stores, bars, and restaurants right now in Hong Kong, and of course on various online platforms. But we haven't had a conventional journey. So as you can see here, because we're not a huge company when we started, all of our branding has been ground up. We've done many pop-up booths, many interactive markets, and that's where we've gotten the word out, because at the crux of this product is our story. And so to bring that story to each customer at every step of the way, we decided that each one of our products is going to have a customized QR code so that when you are drinking this beer, you are able to make that 100% connection with it. So upon scanning this QR code, you will learn how much bread is in your product, where that bread came from, who helped us bring that bread, and even all sorts of information about the beer. So every step of the way, you have all the answers to any questions that might come up. But of course, no business is a business without any challenges. And so our first challenge that we had to face was how do we manage quality? And I think this might be a question that a lot of you have, is when we're using unsold, uneaten surplus bread, how do you ensure that the bread is consumable or doesn't have any bacteria that then seep into the beer? So we decided to follow a multi-pronged process. First, we make sure when we collect all of the bread that we go through intense sorting. 
So we make sure that all the different types of bread is laid out in front of us. We check each and every piece to make sure that there's no mold. So if there ever is mold on the bread, we do not use it. And we make sure that each beer only has one type of bread. So that also helps us with consistency. But more than that, what's good for us is brewing beer happens at such a high temperature, 100 to 150 degrees Celsius around about. And so at this level of temperature, any surface bacteria or E chemicals anyway do not survive. So we're able to make sure that the bacteria does not seep into the beer. And finally, just for an added safety measure, before we put any of our beer on the shelves, we make sure it undergoes lab testing, even though that's not mandated by the Hong Kong government or any food and beverage market in the world. So like I said earlier, we definitely do not want to stop at bread beer, and we are actively working towards hopefully one day there being no food wastage in the form of bread wastage in Hong Kong, and we have many different ideas to do that. So we want to collect the re rejected cereal that is unsold at the end of the day in supermarkets and use that to make beer. Or even, you know, in Hong Kong, a city well known for its cafes and numerous coffee drinkers, after a cup of coffee is brewed, the coffee grounds or coffee beans are co considered used and thrown away. But we want to collect those coffee grounds and those coffee beer to use as flavoring agents for our beer, so making a coffee beer. And we've actually also found a very interesting methodology of turning the mash that's left of wet bread after the bread beer is made back into bread. So please don't be surprised if one day we come to you and we're saying we're selling bread. But as such, this is how we want to create this circular economy model. And to do this, we also wanted to engage the Hong Kong community. So we launched a program called Brea Runners where volunteers, so many of them are students or young professionals like ourselves, they will help us with collecting the bread at the end of the day from the bakeries, deliver it to our breweries, and vice versa. So doing this, we're allowing everyone, literally anyone and everyone, to get involved in the brewery ecosystem. So now on to challenge number two. Hong Kong, of course, like I established earlier, is a very saturated beer market. So how do we carve our own niche? First, we pride ourselves on the fact that we're looking at social innovation and affordability hand in hand. So we're the first beer in Hong Kong that is addressing the huge food wastage problem and we're trying to position ourselves as cheaper than other craft beers. So of course, if you compare our beer to the mass produced beers like Heineken or Carlsberg, we might be a little more expensive, but we're definitely on the more affordable side of things when it comes to craft beer, especially in Hong Kong. And we have found this new model of re-monetizing bread. So this is material that we would otherwise throw away and we're giving it a method to come back into the supply chain and interact with us on a daily basis and in a form that most people like. So with that, we've been very grateful to have support from all over Hong Kong, where we've worked with numerous breweries in Hong Kong, numerous bakeries in Hong Kong, and are always giving back to the social partners in any way, shape, or form. So sometimes if we collect bread that isn't used in the creation of a brew, we are sure to donate that alongside food boxes to the elderly here in Hong Kong on a weekend. So we want to make sure that at every step of rear, we are making a positive impact. So speaking of impact, it's only fair that we quantify what we've done and what we anticipate to do. So in a mere year, we anticipate saving 9.2 tons of unsold bread, 30 hectares worth of landfill space, reduce one ton of carbon dioxide emissions, and 4.3 cubic meters of water usage, all while supporting local breweries here in Hong Kong. We also have many different ideas of integrating sustainable reuse schemes or even merchandising into our system because we want to truly be an overall, all-rounded, sustainable company. With that, here are the four people I keep mentioning. So I'm Anushka on the leftmost side. We have Naman, Devanch, and Suyash. All of us are students who met at HKUST, although one of us has now graduated and doing his master's. And we do anticipate making this our full-time job, hopefully very, very soon. With that, we are very, very supportive um, and supported by the media all around Hong Kong. And we are very grateful for the support that they've given us because no product will reach its peak if the audience does not appreciate it and enjoy it. And with that, I want to reiterate by saying that it's so important for any business to always consider the three Ps, people, planet, and profit. By integrating people to do good things for the planet, you're only bound to make a profit. So with that, cheers to change. Let's hope you like the beer that we make because it does good and tastes better. Thank you. Thanks, Anushka, for sharing the core values of Bria with us. So may all speakers stay online as we will move on to the Q&A session soon. For our audience viewing online, you are also welcome to raise questions through the Q&A box now next to the video frame. So now we have already got some questions. The first question goes to Katerina. 
And the audience wants to know if the pandemic means more business opportunities or obstacles for your business, and which country or region will be the biggest market with the greatest potential from your point of view? That is a very interesting question. Yeah, thanks. Um, so um, we actually, in the industrial business, we were very little affected uh, by the pandemic, uh, in fact. So we see that because, um, you know, human food and uh, animal feed are essential, uh, essential lines of business, essential lines of business. We also had a lot of exclusions from regulatory frameworks in, in the European Union. So we could really uh, proceed business as usual. Uh, where we did see a lot of impact was the education sector in Hong Kong, because obviously schools were closed also here in, uh, uh, in, in, in Europe we saw a lot of restrictions uh, from from that end um, on the uh, on the market uh, end uh, we do see that our primary focus for the industrial business is Europe um, because we have um, very str stricter and stricter regulations due to food waste um, there's very progressive goals uh, on from European legislative end to cut down on it uh, by 30 percent by 2020. Uh, uh, 2025 and um, uh, by 50% by 2030. Um, so we do see that this has an impact on uh, the decision making in large industries. As a next step, of course, we hope to uh, come back to, to Asia also with our industrial technologies, because we do see a lot of potential, especially in post consumer waste, the reg regulatory framework being much uh, more loose. Um, it's also a much more competitive market uh, where you have to succeed with this scale of, of, of technology that we're talking about, which is sort of, it's in an industrial uh, uh, scale, but it is rather small if you compare it to other industries um, in, in an industrial segment. Um, but yes, we do think that, uh, that Asia will be, will be the, the market thereafter that is most interesting. Thank you, Katharina. And the next question goes to Kerry. So the audience asks, do you think the alternative food trend is picking up faster than before, given that people are more environmentally conscious now? Yeah, definitely. I think um, part of it, uh, I will attribute to the whole kind of COVID experience of um, every one of us. Previously, we basically quite take it for granted, you know, if we go to the supermarket, there will be food there. And then we have really not thought about that we could be in a situation, I don't know whether you will remember, there have been a few days where we rushed to the supermarket just to find the shelf are empty. And so we basically exposed that, you know, the supply chain is actually very vulnerable, be it um, the, the, the disruption because of the transportation or because, you know, the whole chain, um, you know, basically subject to a lot of different weak points that can happen. So I think that is also leading up and helping in particular cultivated needs. So in this case, no longer we do, we need to have a farm, have a big piece of land, raise the animal and then, you know, slaughter them and then bring it and distribute that. That is a very, um, you know, conventional centralized system. Uh, in cultivated meat, we actually can set up the same plant, you know, different parts of the world, even if that's it, as long as we have the access to some of the raw material and some power, you could even use solar power. And then we basically do not need to really need to the water or do not need to transport the fish, um, drag them all around the world. We can actually decentralize the whole production of um, meat and protein. So in that sense, it actually increased the uh, food security um, as a solution in the long run. And of course, uh, people are um, now aware of the uh, health and more concerned about the quality of the food we put in their mouth. And so, you know, all of these are attributable to the um, raising awareness and also receptiveness for alternative protein. Um, and um, that we, we see that has been a very basically big change in the past um, one year or so. Thank you, Carrie. So as time is running short, I guess this will be our last question. And our last question goes to Anushka. And this audience want to know how much cleaning is needed for those food waste before you are turning them into beer. And is there any extra work? And do you think this extra work would be a burden for your partners? So the beauty of making beer is that because it all happens at such a high temperature, what we would normally be worried about as a contaminant, you know, in daily, say, for example, food usage does not really come into the picture. So if you're talking about 
the earlier situation I gave where in the morning, of course, bread is a lot more consumed because people are going to work, they need breakfast, on the go, things like that. So they tend to buy bread. Whereas when they're returning from work, nobody really thinks about buying bread on their way home. So the bread is still sitting there and it's been sitting there the whole day. But that might deter someone from picking that bread and eating it at the end of the night. But when you're putting that into beer, the beer doesn't discriminate. So it doesn't care that it's been sitting out there all day because it still has that functional role of barley in it. And as for, you know, the different partners, I think that the model that we've tried to create is one where it's important for us to make working with us easy for our partners, otherwise they won't. So when we first decided to bring in this idea of collecting the bread that doesn't get sold by our partners and using that for beer, of course, they were all very apprehensive because nobody had done bread beer in Hong Kong. And this was four students walking up to the different bakeries and saying, hi, please give us all your bread. We're going to make beer from it. So naturally, they did too have their own doubts on whether we would actually do that or not. But the reason we were able to convince them is because if we weren't in the picture, what these bakeries have to do today is call a delivery partner, call a driver, have them arrange transportation, come to their bakery, collect all of the bread or the materials that they would otherwise want to dispose, and then get them to take it away for them. So essentially, the disposal of their waste was at cost to them. So when we came into the picture, we said, OK, look, we won't charge you anything for the bread. You just give us the bread, and now it's not your problem anymore. We'll take care of it. We'll deliver it from here to there or there to here. And you don't have to think about it anymore. So we gave them almost like a monetary incentive to work with us. And I think at every step for Breer, we're trying to alleviate our stakeholders from extra work and maybe even taking it on ourselves, but introducing it in a new manner. And that's why I think a Breer Runner program is so innovative, because it allows people in Hong Kong who want to make change even after work hours, or if you're a student like me and you have to do it for university, University, this is a fun way to integrate that into something you would have to do anyways. Thanks, Anushka, for answering this question. So once again, Katharina, Carrie, and Anushka, thank you very much for all of your presentations and insights. And I'm quite sure that our audience has learned a lot from this webinar. So for audience, please feel free to scan the QR code shown on the screen to let us know your feedback about this webinar. And you can also stay connected with our smart advisor to explore more possibilities by scanning the QR code on your right-hand side. Our next session will start at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Meanwhile, don't forget to check out our concurrent event, Smart Beast Expo 2021. If you're looking for more event details, you can check out this website. So thank you so much for your support today and see you all tomorrow.